Jane Schnupp here. Welcome to a new edition of the Savvy Sightseer Travelogue series called Video Vacations. Today we are off to Central Europe and Switzerland, which is only about the size of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. Switzerland holds a special place in my heart. The first time I was there, I was a somewhat jaded teenager, but I was awestruck on the bus coming from the airport as we went over a hill and I got my first sight of Geneva, or Genève. It was incredibly clean and picturesque, had the mountain peaks framing the town and its beautiful lake that it shares with France. I've been fortunate enough to go back to the country twice. Once I took a coach trip all around. The other time I toured it by crisscrossing on trains with panoramic windows through the Alps. One word always comes to mind when I think of Switzerland, beautiful. Bordered by Austria, France, Germany, Italy, and Liechtenstein, each region in Switzerland has its own distinctive flair and personality. There are four national languages, French, Italian, German, and Romanche, that's Switzerland's own Latin-based language. There are bustling cities, remote towns, and alpine farms, some of which reportedly have been worked as far back as 4000 BC. And of course, stunning mountains and lakes. There's about 1,500 lakes, and you are never more than 10 miles from one within the country. Surrounded by European Union countries, little Switzerland stands out retaining its independence and its own currency. The Swiss franc, not the euro, is what changes hands here. But it is not listed on currency charts, as you might accept, expect as SF, but rather CHF, which confuses people. CHF stands for Confederatio Helvetica Franc. That's from the early Latin name for the region. We'll start in the northern part of the country in Zurich before moving southwest and onto the French border. We'll work our way east through the Alpine regions. My favorite way to enter the country is by flying in over the Alps from Italy. Of all of the Alps, the Swiss are my favorite and I love the feeling of being absolutely on top of the world. Zurich is this country's largest city, one of the financial capitals of the world with supposedly more banks than dentists. It's a compact, vibrant, cosmopolitan city founded by the Romans in 58 BC as a customs port. Some consider Zurich merely as a travel hub and use it only as a transfer stop linking high-speed trains to other countries. That's their loss though, it's a great destination in itself. Notice the flag, it's red with a white cross and it's also not a rectangle like ours. It's a square similar to the look of their early battle uniforms. If you're confused with the international Red Cross flag, that's okay because the Red Cross founder was Swiss and the banner is an inverted version of the Swiss flag as a tribute to him. If you work up a thirst while walking in the town, you can find one of the many creative fountains for crystal clear drinking water piped in from the mountains. With over 1,200 of these water spouts, Zurich is one of the world's most fountain-friendly cities. They even have guided fountain tours. St. Peter's is the oldest church in Zurich, built in the 9th century with the largest clock face in Europe. It's about 28 and a half feet across, bigger even than London's Big Ben. Fortunately, it was spared when Zurich was accidentally bombed by Allied forces during World War II. Bombing raids hit targets in Switzerland a few times, but the Allies blamed the navigation errors or equipment failure, weather conditions, or even pilot error. The Swiss, though, contended the Allies were protesting their neutrality. There was even a court-martial in 1945, the presiding officer of which was none other than Colonel James Stewart, who flew B-52 bombers in the war before returning to acting here. The pilots were found not guilty, but the U.S. had to pay millions in reparations to the Swiss. Fortunately, the bombs dropped on Zurich did very little damage, and the city was largely untouched, leaving St. Peter's intact, along with winding cobblestone streets packed today with shops, history, and charm. One thing that struck me here was how very quiet it was, despite crowds and busy streets. There were no horns blasting, blaring music, or loud phone chats. It exuded a classy and dignified atmosphere. So imagine my shock when I went to sleep in this Zurich and woke up to a center of chaos and crowds. I figured it must be their 4th of July, but Swiss National Day turns out to be August 1st, just before my visit. That's when they celebrate the 13th century alliance of three cantons or states. 
It is a somewhat subdued event with local parties throughout all of its can cantons, which now number 26. This craziness was an entirely different celebration, a mega party that takes place for one day a little later in August each year and only in Zurich. The annual street parade and Technofest is billed as the world's largest. Enthusiasts from around the world converge on 34 square miles Zurich for the huge outdoor party of street vendors, parades, music, and love mobiles, and above all, dancing in the street. In recent years, up to one million have packed the city's streets, a far cry from the about 1,000 who showed up for its first time in 1992. That's when a student was granted permission to organize a demonstration in support of love, peace, freedom, generosity, and tolerance. This year's event is slated for August 8th, of course, with current circumstances, we'll have to see if that comes about. The skyline at the northern tip of Lake Zurich at the mouth of the Limit River is dominated by the twin-spired 12th century Grossmünster Church. This is one of Zurich's most famous landmarks, in part because this is where the Swiss Reformation started. In 1522, Roman Catholic pastor Zwigli and some friends broke the tradition of fasting during Lent by dividing two smoked sandwiches among them. Zwigli defended his position and opposed those who claimed that their actions had been an act of heresy. The ensuing argument, known as the affair of the sausages, is now considered to be the trigger for the Reformation in Switzerland. This sculpture on the lake shore depicts a variation on Greek mythology and the story about Ganymede, who was a very handsome young man, abducted by Zeus and taken to the top of Mount Olympus. This statue, donated to the city by its sculptor in 1952, doesn't depict an abduction. Instead, with an outstretched hand, this Ganymede pleads with Zeus in the form of the eagle to whisk him away to nearby alpine peaks. The National Museum in Zurich is the city's top sightseeing attraction. Swiss history is laid out here from its beginnings to the present in a more than 100-year-old castle. 820,000 objects span the ages, there's earthenware shards that date back to the B.C. era, right up through to Christmas ornaments from the 21st century. It is the largest cultural and historic collection in the country. The building itself is part of history and is designated an historical monument of national importance. It's not just the collection housed in it that reflects Swiss history at different times. The purpose-built museum itself does likewise. The architect combined design features from the late medieval period as well as the modern era to create a so-called single whole, a melding of collection, exhibition, and architecture. Amazing attention was paid to every detail, such as this close-up of the artistry under the eave. Exhibits run a gamut. There's archaeological displays, carriages, ceramics, and glass, technology, paintings, sculpture, jewelry, and a complete comprehensive textile and fashion section. One of the highlights is this celestial globe designed by Jost Berge, a brilliant astronomer, mathematician, and maker of clocks and astronomical instruments. His celestial globe was the first ever mechanical system to display February 29 in leap years. It is considered a groundbreaking symbol of European thought. In addition to the globe, he also invented many other things, including a clock with three hands, thereby creating the second as a unit of time. The Swiss lay claim to some of the world's most famous inventions. They created the Helvetica font, Velcro, cellophane, the Swiss army knife, and even LSD. Swiss chemist Albert Hoffmann synthesized LSD for the first time in 1938. The Swiss also introduced the world to bobsledding and luge as competitive sports. While Zurich is the financial center of Switzerland, it is not the capital. That honor goes to Bern, about 60 miles to the southwest. Bern is, to me, an unlikely national capital. There's nothing stuffy nor self-important about Bern, which became the capital in 1848. Here, children race around in a fountain while 26 jets of water, one for each canton, randomly spurt. So that's not the usual trappings of a country's capital, but such is the charm of Bern. All this action is going on right in front of the parliament and possibly on a ton of gold. Under the square is believed the equivalent of Fort Knox, 
reportedly buried here are the vaults of the Swiss National Bank, which overlooks the square. Though the bank is kind of tight-lipped about their store's exact locations, it is widely believed that about half of all Swiss gold is guarded here. Every town in Europe has an elaborate glockenspiel. Switzerland is no exception, other than to say it has one of the best. On Market Street, the clock tower is part of the city's original fortification wall from 1218. Ornate astronomical clock with its moving figures was built in 1530 into the former defense gate. It serves as the city's main clock, but for half of the year, it is about one hour behind due to daylight savings time. It also shows the sign of the zodiac, the date, and even the phase of the moon. At four minutes before the hour, it just bounces, Father Time turns an hourglass, and a rooster crows. Watching the clock, it's hard to imagine that just a few steps away from such whimsy is a humble apartment where something decidedly not frivolous took place. A narrow winding staircase leads to the small second floor home of Albert Einstein. Here he worked, devoting himself to physics concepts and developing the theory of relativity. It's a very small museum because this was just the space where he lived. Nearby is a much larger museum dedicated to Einstein the man as well as the scientist. It takes up the entire second floor of the Historical Museum of Bern. It has 550 items and 70 films to give a full overview of his life. My favorite spot in Bern is busy Market Street. It's named the UNESCO World Heritage Site for its sandstone houses, narrow streets, fountains, and the medieval air that make this city unique. Again, certainly this doesn't look like most capital cities. Crossing it can be a real challenge, and visitors need to remember that trams trump traffic. People watching from a central bench, bench while snacking on a sandwich is a traveler's must-do, as it is fun to watch the pedestrians try to get from one side of the street to the other without being trampled. Lucerne is a place you could spend a full week and not get to see everything. I consider it a multifaceted city on steroids. At times, it's serene and relaxing, or wild and bawdy, or sophisticated and expensive, or loaded with tacky souvenir shops. A most dramatic sight in the city is the Dying Lion of Lucerne. It's a tribute to the more than 600 Swiss guards or mercenaries who were massacred when protecting France's King Louis XVI and the Royal Palace in Paris in 1792 when it was being stormed during the French Revolution. American author Mark Twain said, it is the saddest and most moving piece of rock in the world. The Swiss soldiers' names are etched into the stone, and the lion symbolizes their strength, courage, and loyalty. Sculptor Lucas Ahorn was a trifle bit upset that the city council reduced his pay in the end, and whether it was spite against them for doing so, or a knock on the French for the way the guards were treated, it appears he spitefully added a little something to the 33 by 20 foot work carved into a sandstone rock. Look closer. The shape of the cave? It's in the shape of a boar. Lucerne is a photographer's dream location. It is a town of beauty and history. This junction of Lake Lucerne and River Rus, ringed by the mountains, is a popular photo op. The Chapel Bridge, the oldest, prettiest, wooden-covered bridge in Europe, was constructed in the early 1300s and connects the pedestrian-only old town to the new, linking the past to the present, both physically and metaphorically. The Chapel Bridge and the Water Tower were parts of the oldest medieval city fortification of Lucerne. The tower served many functions over the years, a dungeon, an archive, and a treasury vault until the 19th century. Today, a traditional association uses it as a club room. Swans enjoy floating around here. They were reportedly a gift from Francis Louis XIV to thank the Swiss guards for protecting him. Triangular paintings on the bridge's overhead spans depict the town's and country's history. Unfortunately, a fire that started on a leisure boat that was moored under the bridge in 1993 destroyed many of them, but a lot do remain or have been restored. Street art takes a new meaning on in Lucerne. Murals can take up entire houses, like this one on the restaurant Fritzi. 
Bawdy artwork irreverently portrays the Fritzy family and friends reveling in Mardi Gras festivities. Across the street, you can take in a traditional folklore show. It's a fun way to enjoy Swiss cuisine while hearing alphorns, traditionally used to call in the cows, and seeing robust clapping dances, all the while learning about Swiss culture. Locals found unusual ways to entertain themselves through the long winters before Xbox and live streaming came along. Who knows? With stay-at-home rules now, people may revive such old amusements as broom music. <laughs> For a less noisy pastime, good options are people watching on the pedestrian boardwalk on the shores of Lake Lucerne or a cruise on the lake. Mount Pilatus is one of the most scenic wonders in Lucerne. At nearly 7,000 feet, the mountain towers over the town amid a range of smaller mountains, one of which kept a tremendous secret. Switzerland is synonymous with neutrality, but it is not oblivious to the vagaries of war. It's virtually obscure from passers-by in Stansted on Lake Lucerne is a nondescript shed-like building. Uh, this is the entryway to a massive hidden fortress called Festen Fierigen. There are believed to be about 15,000 buried strongholds around Switzerland. Should Switzerland be invaded during World War II, the plan was to squirrel away important citizens and army personnel. The rest of the, the residents, uh, that is the taxpayers who had funded it, would have been left to their own devices as bridges and roads were blown. Blueprints for any new bridge building at that time had to include built-in explosive. Although billed as a museum, Furigan doesn't resemble any usual military display. Visitors can step behind and aim a cannon and observe model soldiers at the ready. The facility could house up to 100 people and could store provisions for up to three weeks. The barracks were set up for troops to sleep in staggered shifts, and the kitchen was primed for feeding the masses. Beyond Switzerland's major cities, there's so much more to see. Now we'll look at the very elite and scenic south. We'll start with a little town by the border with Italy that has claimed to one of Switzerland's best known sites. At Zermatt, there's a gateway to one of the most famous vistas in the world. The tiny village is largely pedestrian only, but not just for walkers of the human kind. Streets give way every morning and afternoon to a parade of black neck goats, also known as glacier goats. They make their way between their home and the mountain pastures. In the 1950s, the black neck goats were almost extinct. They only had about four or 500 of them left. Today, there are about 3,000. From Zermatt, Europe's highest rack railway whisks visitors up to Gornergrat Station and awe-inspiring views. These two guys think they have a hard job of it. They think they are the stars of the mountain. And while they are pretty photogenic, the real star is the breathtaking view. You honestly feel like you're on top of the world here. This is the first sight I saw when I got off the train at Gornergrat. And then you see it, famous in movies and calendars and the Toblerone candy bar. The mighty Matterhorn Towers. On my first time back to Switzerland, this was the site that greeted me. But sadly, no one is guaranteed a day when that view is available. On the second visit, this is what people saw. And I swear I took it from exactly the same spot. Geneva, at the southern tip of Lake Geneva, a.k.a. Lake Lachman, excuse me, Loch Lehman, had enthralled me on my first visit to Switzerland in 1972. But it's not everyone's favorite because it doesn't have the same personality as Zurich, Zermatt, and Bern. Travel guru Rick Steves calls it one of Switzerland's largest and most sterile cities and says it gets uh, the nice place to live, but I wouldn't want to visit a ward. It's pleasantly situated, he said, on a lake, just like Buffalo is. But beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. Geneva's Jet d'eau, or water jet fountain, is one of the tallest in the world. Originally, it was constructed in 1886. The 100-foot-high fountain acted as a safety valve to control and release excess pressure at a hydraulic water facility nearby. It became a symbol of the city's and the country's strength 
ambition, and vitality. So in the 1950s, it was enlarged and relocated to the center of the lake. It now gushes upward to 460 feet high. Every second, about 500 liters of water are expelled at a speed of about 124 miles per hour. Each moment, seven tons of water spew from this magnificent jet. Its hours of operation vary with the season and weather conditions. This southwest corner of Switzerland is considered its version of a sophisticated Riviera. As mentioned, Lake Geneva is split with France, and here at the borderline between the countries, there is a decidedly French flavor in the towns. Tiny but expensive resort town of Montreux is a great place from which to boat around the lake. With less than 13 square miles, Montreux and the surrounding region has an inordinate list of rich and famous who have called it home. Musicians especially love the place. Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull, Freddie Mercury of Queen, Shania Twain, the country singer, Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky have all sung its praises. Others include Noel Coward, the British actor, Zelda Fitzgerald, wife of F. Scott, and the Empress Elizabeth of Austria, or Empress Sissi called it her favorite spot. This little statue memorializes another famous resident, Charlie Chaplin. Writers have also been inspired by the region. A small rocky island on Lake Geneva is the home of picturesque Xi'an Castle. It was built in the 12th century. Up until the 16th century, it was home to the powerful Savoy ruling family, and it functioned over time as a fortress, an arsenal, warehouse, hospital, and even a prison. Above rooms are well appointed. This is one of four grand halls that spelled power and prestige. The castle was continuously inhabited, so it was always splendidly maintained. But below was another story. It had a singular purpose, as a dungeon. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a famous Genevan philosopher, writer, and composer, was the first in the 1760s to mention Chian in his writing. But he wasn't the last. Victor Hugo, Charles Dickens, and even Hemingway all wrote of it. But perhaps the best-known work featuring Chian is by the English poet Lord Byron, who was inspired to write The Prisoner of Xi'an about the five-year imprisonment and torture of 16th century renegade monk who had gotten on the wrong side of a Savoy. He, along with others, were chained to these pillars. They chained us each to a column stone, and we were three, yet each alone. We could not move a single pace. We could not see each other's face. The poet Percy Shelley's wife, Mary, was also inspired by this region. Staying at the lake with friends during a rainy spell, the group decided to beat boredom with a ghost story competition. Young Mary was intimidated by famous authors that were there with her. Her husband, Percy, of course, Lord Byron, and John Polidori, who was credited with writing the first modern vampire story. They were all distinguished writers. But Mary finally found inspiration in a half-dream she had on the last night that had terrified her. When she awoke, she quickly wrote, It was on a dreary night of November. We know her tale of horror today as Frankenstein. Gestad is a destination of the rich and famous with mountains ranging from three to 5,000 feet tall. It is a mix of boutique shops and wood chalets. For me, it defines window shopping because that was about all I was going to be able to do on the main street called the Promenade, where you find shops like Hermé and Louis Vuitton. The German-influenced town is especially popular as a ski and après ski resort region. Gestad's logo is come up and slow down. Royals Princess Diana, Prince Rainier, and Princess Grace, along with entertainment royalty, such as Michael Jackson and Elton John, are among the many luminaries who have visited or owned residences in Gestad. Jackie Kennedy was photographed here as she took a sled ride with her daughter Caroline. 007's Roger Moore was photographed of all things milking cows here. The actor Richard Burton called it the most beautiful place in the world. My favorite Gestad visitor was this easy rider perched on a motorcycle. The Swiss take pet ownership very seriously. There are taxes for owning a dog, for example, that are determined by the dog's size and weight. Dog owners are also required to take a training course to learn how to properly care for their pets. Swiss law also prohibits owning pets that are deemed social animals, 
those that rely on interaction with their own species, unless you have two of them. This makes it illegal to keep just one guinea pig, canary, parakeet, or other social creature. With the world's most stringent animal welfare laws, Switzerland considers isolation for such animals as abuse. This has sparked unique services, such as a lawyer who defends animals and a pet renting service that supplies an animal in case one of the pair dies so the owner can comply with the law until another can be adopted. One favorite mountain town escape for the sophisticated set is St. Moritz. It came to fame as a ski destination for the rich and famous as the result of a challenge. Hotelier Johan Badrut wanted to cash in on his location in winter as well as in summer. In 1864, he dared a group of summertime regulars to come back in winter as his guests for free. They, of course, loved it, word spread, and the rest is history. So along with Zermatt and Gestad, St. Moritz is considered a go-to ski town. Scattered around the town are these eccentric and seemingly out-of-place statues. They are the Angels Demons series. Black, larger than life, about 20 foot tall sculptures of infants bearing both wings and horns. They are the work of a Russian artist group. The Angels Demons are predictive paraders, reminding people there is good and evil in everyone, and evil may look like good, and vice versa. In Moritz, I found a patch of Edelweiss, made famous in the Sound of Music movie. It is not the official flower of the Alps, nor any country's national song, but it is considered the unofficial national flower of Switzerland. In Germany, in German, Edel means noble and Weiss means white. It symbolizes daring, courage, and noble purity. Since it only grows in harsh mountain climates, young men would climb the Alps, often on the most dangerous paths, to bring some Edelweiss to their special girl as a symbol of true love. A great way to really enjoy the beauty of this country is to get out of the major cities and off the highway and onto the Bernina Express. From St. Moritz, the train spirals down from its highest point of about 7,000 feet through 55 tunnels and over 196 bridges from alpine glaciers to palm trees on the Italian border. The railway, the only circular viaduct in the world, has UNESCO World Heritage status. There are stunning, unspoiled views all the way down, countless waterfalls ending at Lake Pasciavo, where Italy is just five miles away. I like to end my, all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that, always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. To see more of Switzerland or any of my European destinations, go to my website. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. When libraries are again offering programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Stay healthy, stay home, au revoir.